Okay, thanks for coming. So today we have uh, Professor John Pepp uh, this and for the IBS now. Even though she visited here many times, this is going to be her first talk on IBS. So we'll talk about game theoretic model for time and space. Thanks for the invitation and thanks uh, for coming. So today I'd like to introduce game theoretic perspective of various problems, which uh, will turn out to have lots of connection to graph theory. Uh, so this area is too broad to list them all. So I just simply focus on only two specific topics. So the first one is uh, like some kind of like diffusion through a graph. And in this talk, I probably uh, use like uh, this network and graph in a mixed way. I try to uh, use more graph, but in all the literature about this uh, topics, uh, they all say like network and nodes and links. So I try to uh, convert everything into our uh, own, but, but these two things are the same thing. And later on, I'll use this uh, contagion game as the first topic. And the second one is uh, what is called network creation game. So as you can imagine from their titles, uh, the first one is kind of uh, analysis on given graph structure. So when some structure is given, then what's going on this structure? On the other hand, the second one, the second problem is to find or formulate a graph structure toward given constraints. So a structure is not uh, determined yet, but uh, we have some constraints and to reach uh, this goal, like what kind of graph structure will be the best and so on. So for the first part, uh, the possible maybe very broad questions are to find some reasons why an innovation fails to spread through a population or how interactions within individuals in population can affect the spread. And in this case, structure of this uh, graph really matters. And then maybe how fast an innovation diffuses through a network. But for our, uh, for today's talk, we're not going to talk about the third one, but there are a lot of uh, related issues uh, with this question. And so to start with, uh, let me uh, quickly go over basic definitions uh, with this payoff matrix. So in game theory, uh, payoff matrix is the basic thing, but it's not an actual like matrix. It has some like uh, arrays of numbers, which is kind of uh, information table about the rule of the game. And in our uh, case, there are, uh, there are two players, player A and player B, uh, player one and player two, and then they have like two uh, options to choose. A and B, and that's the rule of the game. And then this payoff matrix, uh, rep uh, presents the value or the payoff when this player, uh, each player can get with this uh, each option. For example, like player one and player two both adapt option A, then they each of them get the payoff of one minus Q when Q is between zero and one. And then if they both adapt B, then each of them get payoff of Q. But if they adapt opposite options, then none of them get any uh, payoff, like uh, the payoff is zero. So for example, you can imagine like uh, A and B are two different languages, not compatible. So if uh, each player can speak only their own language, then, and they are different, then they cannot communicate. So they, can, they cannot get anything. But if they speak the same language, then they can communicate, for example. So it's uh, so every description is uh, in this uh, in the sentences, but it's better to see this uh, payoff with this one part and the other part. The blue part is the player one, so with this vertical way, and then the red part you can read this as like horizontal way for player uh, two. So if, if for example, if player uh, one plays with A and then player two plays with A, then, then uh, player one gets one minus Q as their payoff and then player two uh, gets one minus Q as their payoff and so on. So this is just the translation about the description. And then this contagion game uh, uh, as of today's topic, uh, 
has these mechanisms. So the AD contagion game is played on a graph. So graph is given, and then vertices are players. And the vertex and a vertex plays the game with its neighbors only. It's not like any randomly uh, random like player, but it can play only with its neighbors. And then before the game starts, every vertex adapted option B. So option B is like old kind of uh, option, and then now new option will come, like an innovation. So some vertices take innovation A to begin with, and the vertex plays the game. So in other words, it chooses one of the options in a way that gives higher payoffs. So for example, this is a local structure of vertex B. So we have like large graph and then now B is a player. And then um, some of vertices have uh, option B and then some of the vertices have option A. And now when it comes to uh, vertex B's turn, now V calculates its payoff. When, uh, what if it chooses A, then the value is three times one minus Q, and then what if it chooses B, uh, B then the payoff will be two Q. So which one is uh, better, uh, depending on which one is larger, uh, B will take uh, one of the options, but it depends on the value of Q. So uh, if Q is less than three fifths, then V will choose A. On the other hand, if Q is bigger than three fifths, then V will choose B. So the contagion game on this infinite graph setting, and maybe uh, we'll only focus on this regular infinite graph, but the general question is what kind of graph structure of G on a population is more advantageous for a new option to be spread over uh, the old option in the population? So our goal is to make it like epidemic. So in the beginning, there's only one option B. But now a new option comes in and then replace this by uh, this new option. And then this is really a technical description and formal description. But I think uh, you, if you understood this process, then maybe uh, casually speaking, to the example, all of, vertex, uh, all of the neighbors of vertex B already had chosen something, right? Yes. So, so, so a vertex only plays if all of its neighbors already have chosen, or how, how does it? No. So. No, they have these uh, options already, and then, and then we every vertex will have its own turn, right? But it doesn't have uh, to be only one turn. It may come with other turn. And then whenever it plays with its own turn, then it will calculate its payoff and then take another option. So it could, like in the beginning, it may have like uh, option B, but when the dynamics changes, then maybe in the next turn, it will choose A. Like that. Yes, yes. So the sequence comes in here. So now, in before the game starts, everything, every vertex has only B, but now some vertices will take this innovation, and then we say this as an initial set. And then, uh, now we define this uh, profile as a sequence, like you said. So that is just the which vertex will play in which turn. So some vertex may play multiple times in some order. So under this uh, situation, we just define this contagion game G, the given graph structure, and the value Q. Option A will become epidemic if there is a strategy sequence alpha and the finite initial set S0. So that means we have this infinite graph. And then if you could find some finite set, like any kind of finite set of having A in the beginning, uh, whereas others have and then can you find an appropriate sequence, I mean, uh, appropriate sequence to make everything to uh, have A at the end. So if that happens, then we say A is epidemic. And if that cannot happen, no matter how large, like finite set you can take, and then no matter what kind of sequence you take, it never happens. That means it's not epidemic. So 
in that case, um, we, we can see that if uh, A becomes epidemic at some value, for example, like Q is like 0 0.3, then if Q is less than that number, it's always epidemic. On the other hand, if uh, A is not epidemic with this value like 0 0.7, for example, then any number Q bigger than 0 0.7, A cannot be be epidemic on the same graph. So in that case, it's reasonable to think about this uh, value, the Q, when like Q is less than this uh, capital Q, A becomes epidemic whenever the value is less than Q. On the other hand, uh, whenever Q is bigger than this uh, capital number Q, then it's not epidemic. So it can be any value in between zero and one. So the, the threshold in uh, this number is called threshold. Pi is just the name, the vertex with this i attached. So in the sequence, i just call this, uh, the first. V1 is the vertex of first player, and then V2 is uh, as a second player, some vertex uh, playing this uh, game as a second player, and so on. Because at the end, so just you will pick one vertex at a time. But at the end, I mean, there's no end because it will just uh, continue. But every vertex must play at some point. So that because initially it had uh, option B, then it should play to change this into option A. Right? So you, this sequence must include all the vertices, but possibly multiple times. The strategy or the sequence must mm -hmm. have each vertex at least a certain number of times, right? Just once. Oh, one, one is enough? Yeah, one is enough. Sometimes you need many times. Mm. Yeah, maybe, but one is enough. Yeah. So if you have a star, mm -hmm. infinite star, and you start with the vertex. Infinite star? Uh, so a single vertex that's connected to all the other vertices. Oh, okay. And if you have that, that central mm -hmm. vertex as mm -hmm. A. Mm -hmm. Do you have to play A? Can you choose not to have? No, in this case, we only consider this boundary degree. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, did I mention this earlier? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, boundary degree is uh, important. And then eventually, you will fo we'll focus on like more like regular degree base. OK, so for example, if you have uh, this infinite graph, I mean, it, con it continues to every direction. So we pick this set, like nine vertices in this uh, positions and A, and then others uh, have B. And now in this above uh, infinite group, if Q is less than 3 eighths, then we can find a sequence of vertices with A for being epidemic. So do you have an idea? So A here, right? So any start with any vertex with this uh, at least three neighbors with A, and then the next one is uh, the opposition, and the next one, and next one. And then now you obtain the same pattern as before, and then you can find this uh, order. So now you find some order, and you can imagine that it will continue, and everything is replaced by A. On the other hand, given any finite set of initial adapters, like in a, uh, the initial set, if Q is bigger than 3 8, then there's no sequence, no way of making it epidemic. So this is not a trivial uh, uh, exercise, but I think it's a good exercise for you. Uh, for you. So, so in that, that means like from the previous definition, Q, uh, uh, the threshold, the contingent threshold about this example, Q is 3 8. So there is a known result by uh, Morris, and this Morris is the first person to come up with this model of this contagion game, and he's, I think he's an economist. So in the A-B contagion game with Q, the contagion threshold any infinite graph with a boundary degree is at most 1 over 2. So I mean, intuitively, it must be like 1 over 2, because if it is bigger than 1 over 2, then the payoff with A is always less then the payoff of having B, and then B are already taken, and then we have only small portion 
of this A, then it's not advantageous at all. But this is not a trivial uh, result either. And then uh, I'm not going to go over the proof because uh, our main focus is like another uh, model other than this simpler one. So does this theorem apply that the contagion threshold then always exists? Yes. Ah, yes. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, the existence mm -hmm. is also another uh, matter, but we assume that uh, we accept this uh, result. So um, as I said as a remark, if uh, the value is certain number in the epidemic, then smaller one is always epidemic and larger one, something like that. What, with that argument, you can see that. So uh, the bound is actually sharp. And there is an example of this uh, sharp example. And one is infinite path, like our path. But this is not the only uh, example. They're like thick lines. So we just plot up each vertex into like delta many where uh, uh, and then um, make them complete between two parts, like consecutive parts, and then we have this thick lines. And then now you see once Q is slightly less than one over two, you can always win. Why? Because you take as your initial set as any of this one part and then take this alternating way and you can make them all A eventually. But once it is bigger than 1 over 2, then there's no way. I mean, you can find some argument if not uh, making it. And anyway, like from this example, I mean, from this result, once the value is bigger than 1 over 2, you cannot uh, make them epidemic. So that's uh, the sharpness uh, example and then bounded sharp. So that was not. Uh, I want to say today, but that is from the motivation of the simpler basic, and then now slightly add one more option. So uh, the Simorica et al. in 2007 suggested a bilingual model. So from the name, you can already imagine what this will work like. So the bilingual model is we consider two options, A and B, that are not compatible with each other. So they couldn't communicate. But in the bilingual model, we allow another option, bilingual option. So AB can communicate with A, and then AB can communicate with B as well, with both A and B. But things are not so easy all the time. To take this option, you have to pay something, right? So a player must pay a fixed penalty or a fixed cost for learning two languages, right? For edge, for adapting this bilingual option. And then hence the total cost for a vertex to be bilingual is r times uh, the degree. Or if we consider only like a regular graph, then this is uh, the degree, the regularity. And then the contagion game, we consider the same thing, exactly the same way. So now we have graph structure g and the value q, and then depending on what the penalty value will be. So it also depends on r. And then we consider this contagion game, well, this Q is between 0 and 1, and the R is positive. And so now this matrix, the payoff matrix, becomes like 3 by 3. And uh, we add one more lines each. And you see uh, the first uh, 2 by 2 part is the same as before. And this. Um, Bilingual option case. If B speaks with AB, then AB can speak with B only. It cannot be AB cannot take one minus Q because they do not speak with uh, A, right? On the other hand, if AB speak with A, then we'll speak with A. So that's the payoff from taking this option A, but it must pay some penalty, so it's like one minus Q minus R. So what about like they make this A, B, and A, B play together. And then now they just take maximum of this Q and one of this Q. And later, eventually, we can imagine that it will be like Q must be at most one over two. So maximum will be always one minus Q. But at this point, we don't have this bias. We just have the setting. OK, so here's the similar, almost the same definition as before. 
So again, we have this input regular graph setting, and then find some finite set of taking this uh, innovation A, although all the others have B. And now, once the game starts, then each player can choose three options, A, B, or AB, depending on what makes the payout the largest. And then we have the same concept as this epidemic situation, and then the threshold exists as well. But the value depends on R. So whenever R is given, then the threshold will be given. So it's better to consider Q and R together. So now we consider, we talk about this, instead of saying like threshold, we say epidemic region. So epidemic region is like Q comma R, the ordered pair, this point on this QR plane where this A is epidemic in GQR. So now you can imagine that, well, this QR uh, plane, uh, the epidemic region is some kind of like polygon, but not always convex, you'll see uh, later in the various examples. And then as a notation, uh, when G is given, then this omega sub G is epidemic region. But now we have this uh, omega sub delta, because we consider only regular graphs, that means that's the union of uh, all this epidemic region of infinite delta regular graphs. And now we're interested in determining this uh, omega sub delta for every delta at least two. So now we formulate our problem. Okay, so let me introduce some of uh, the results from this seminal paper. Uh, so one very really useful uh, result is there's no vertex changes from certain direction, either from A to B. Like along this uh, games with this sequence, once a vertex adapts A, then there's no reason or there's no way uh, to change this AB in the later play. And the same way from uh, A to AB or A to B or A, a B to B. So there are certain directions happening. Like uh, always, uh, once it chooses A, then it will stay with A forever. Once it chooses AB, maybe there is another, uh, uh, still have chance to change the same to A, but not B, and so on. So maybe this game is more complicated than only two options, because previously, once it has A, then it's done already. But in this case, well, some vertex still has to choose A, B at the moment, and then later it may have to come with another turn to change this to A, and then eventually will take all A. So in some sense, it takes longer than this A, B game, but that's the situation. And oh, I have to mention the other two. So for every infinite delta regular graph G, a cannot become epidemic in the game if Q is bigger than 1 over 2, the same result as this, uh, the previous one. But uh, Q is less than 1 over 2, it's not guaranteeing the epidemic condition because of R. So in fact, there are just some Q and R, such that every contagion game, like every graph, any kind of this uh, regular graph with this Q and R, a cannot become epidemic. So you can imagine that if you determine some epidemic region, this Q and R. And then from the second result, this will appear only this side. But that's not all the region. There should be some point which is always outside this epidemic region of any graph. But they didn't determine which one specifically. It's not a constructive proof, but just the existence. Is R, is R like zero? R? No, positive. So it should be. Okay. So R is uh, bigger than Q or 1 minus Q. Uh, can the values become negative with the choosing of AB? R is what? If, if R is uh, 
bigger than q or bigger than 1 minus q. Um, can the values in the game uh, for choosing a, b then become negative? Not necessarily. Are you saying that r is so bigger than q so can here and then r is 1 minus q? Can, can you go back to this, uh, to the matrix thing? Um, yeah, so the mq is the maximum of these two, so you can subtract r. Yeah, so uh, in, in this table, if uh, uh, for a, b, if we have 1 minus q minus r, that yeah. can be a negative value. Yeah, right? so this part is never included in this estimator, right? And oh, that part is so, negative. So, so yeah, can, can mm -hmm. so if we, I mean, independently of Q, if we just right. choose R large right. enough, right. there will be yeah, negative yeah. values yeah. here, right? Yeah. But since you're playing with your neighbors, you will accumulate the values. So the total sum doesn't have to be negative, right? The one uh, with your one neighbor, the value can be negative, but right. total sum may be. And then it's useful to uh, know about something like uh, called blocking structure. It is uh, it looks very really artificial, but that plays a role of excluding the points. I mean, if you have in your graph structure, if you have some kind of this obstruction, then this will prevent you to make a become epidemic, something like that. And then that's one of uh, sufficient conditions to become blocking structure. And then the importance about this blocking structure is this theorem. So for every contagion game, option A cannot be epidemic in this Q and R, if and only if every cofinite set. Cofinite means uh, it's uh, the complement of any finite set. So every cofinite set of vertices contains a blocking structure. So whenever uh, you just get rid of some finite part, you always obtain some fixed shape of this pair uh, subset of vertex subset, uh, subset of vertices S A B and S B satisfying this condition with fixed R and Q. That means this R uh, Q R is not included in this epidemic region. So it's very useful to determine some sort of like upper bound of your region. And then finding this sequence is to determine this lower bound. So when you determine your African region precisely, just make your upper bound and lower bound as close as possible. That's the idea. Okay. So for example, we come back to this uh, thick line. And this is not even trivial case to determine this abdomen region. And in fact, the right side picture is the complete epidemic region. It is uh, fully determined. But let me quickly show you how it works. So to determine the region, we want to find some lower bound region and upper bound region, hopefully, uh, to become the same. So in this thick line case, I'm going to omit all those uh, possible edges in between, but pick the set and make them A. While oh, L delta is this thick so in this case this is L6 okay. so all the rest of them have B now we play with uh, the vertices here so maybe you can choose any vertex. The order doesn't matter in the set, so just pick this one. So 
it has A and then others have B. And so on. Okay. And now for this, uh, let's say this set is S0 and then maybe this set is S1. And for any vertex in S1, if this vertex chooses A, then the payoff will be 3 times 1 minus Q. And if this vertex chooses AB, then this will be, and because of the previous theorem, Q should be at most 1 over 2, so you can always take 1 minus Q as a maximum. And then, if it chooses B, then it will be 3Q. So there are two cases where this A uh, is the max gives the maximum payoff, or AB gives the maximum payoff. Okay, so the case one is uh, B, payoff of B and payoff of A. And then we have case two. AB is the largest. And now we just find the condition for being this case and that case. So for the first case, if you solve this inequality in comparison, then you will obtain this part as a sufficient part. So this part is sort of like guaranteed. But maybe you have to play with others later. And then the case two situation, if you solve this inequalities, then you will have this case. But this is not done yet, because anyway, uh, this the vertex must play again to change this into A. And then other possibility the later on is now, uh, they will play with other, like AB and AB, and then the next group will play with AB, AB, or like AA, and then they will, there's a room for changing. And then you just list all of these cases, and also, there are not that many cases, maybe four more cases, and then list them. And then eventually, <laughs> you will obtain uh, this figure. So that is... together, the intersection of these three will become a lower bound. So now, well, it's reasonable, but the difficult part is how do we obtain this upper bound? How do we exclude all this white part? And now it's time to use this blocking structure according to uh, the theorem. Well, if you can find this common blocking structure to obtain another, like this uh, common region, and then you can probably win. So the blocking structure in this case is in this thick line, whenever you just take get rid of some finite part, anyway, one of these ends will survive at some point. Say the right end will continue. So now you pick these two groups as SAB set when it is listed here. SAB. And then these two consecutive parts of SB. So you can always find this particular structure after you removing finite part. And then play with this SAB and SP. And then plugging in the condition into uh, the structure. Then you can find, in this case, delta. you can uh, calculate this value as 3. Here, uh, the degree 
and the degree and those degrees will be free and then uh, calculated and then you will obtain um, Sorry, it was 1 over 2, if you calculate them all. And then now you see that this is exactly uh, the complement of the previous case. So in this case, luckily, we could find uh, this lower bound and upper bound are equal. But for many, uh, even like simpler I mean, uh, easy cases, it's really difficult in so many cases. So uh, in this literature, they claim that, well, the reason uh, the epidemic region of this graph is completely determined like that, but I couldn't find anywhere what the reason was or explanation was. So probably if you <laughs> see, there's so many uh, different lines, right, the boundaries, so it will be plenty of cases, right? So if you have free time, maybe you can try, but <laughs> I'm not recommending <laughs> so much. In the stuff that I got, the yellow area is where you use... A, B, right. and yes. and yes. eventually converge mm -hmm. to all A, and then yes. the white area above mm -hmm. is just no. Right. So, kind of, this is that introduce the ability to take A, B, can uh, convert. Right, A, B is really making uh, this uh, dynamics so yeah. interesting and more complicated sometimes. And not, not intuitive in some, sometimes. Okay, so now. Let me quickly uh, mention what we did for this uh, topic. So an infinite regular tree is a connected acyclic and infinite graph, each of whose degree is the same. Just the same, just no cycle. Regular infinite is the definition. In this case, uh, if this region, if T delta is an infinite uh, delta regular tree, then the epidemic region for this uh, region is always contained in any other kind of this regular, delta regular, uh, perhaps uh, epidemic region. So in some sense, this is a uh, universal minimum region. So in other words, like if you have this tree structure, infinite tree structure, then it makes uh, the most difficult to spread. Right? So you have to avoid this, uh, any kind of this uh, infinite tree structure. And then furthermore, if an infinite delta regular graph G contains the infinite delta regular tree, except for the root with degree delta plus one. So infinite graph is tricky because uh, you start with some root and then it has like regular shape. But once when you want to attach this one of the other parts, then you have to lose some uh, of its neighbors and so on. But that's enough. That's OK. So if your graph contains at some part, like your graph, infinite graph, has very nice parts, but if you have some bad part, like infinite tree attached, then immediately the epidemic region of this whole graph becomes the smallest case. So immediately it becomes a disadvantage for A to become epidemic. So for example, the, in the first part of the mm -hmm. statement, needs to be connected for that to be true, right? Yes. So this is uh, when delta is 5. But we don't have uh, one neighbor. So this uh, vertex will be attached to some other part. So if your graph contains this uh, continuing and that part, then this becomes very small. This has really small, like, after the region, like the tree case. So that is actually uh, the epidemic region of delta regular tree. And so now we compare this epidemic region for thick line, which uh, looks like the best example so far, having like largest epidemic region. And then we have this worst example, a uh, regular tree. So we kind of believe that um, maybe other other regular graphs, infinite regular graphs, the region will be just between these two. But we're not sure. And then we determined that this is the minimum, the universal minimum. But still, it's not true. Uh, we haven't found any uh, proof 
for uh, saying that, well, this is the maximum case. However, um, we can uh, find not just this infinite, uh, thick line, but like some variations of having this huge uh, epidemic region. So now we consider this half line. Like with this uh, two ends, we only need to take the one end. And then make many copies, like n copies. And then uh, list these half lines, and these half lines, and these half lines. And then if you need, you just add some of these vertices to make all together them still like delta regular. The same, uh, having the same regularity as this uh, half line. And now, here's one example. Right? So you, you attach those four uh, half lines, and then you don't add any vertex in this case to make this uh, are still regular. Like what's the delta? Delta is six. Right? So you can make a lot of, like infinitely many of these uh, constructions. And then all of these graphs have the same epidemic region as just thick line. So it has pretty large epidemic region. So it's just advantageous structure. And then you can still uh, make some comparison with this, uh, lots of this uh, more like very dense graph and then like sparse graph like tree. And then we think that, well, other graphs will be somewhere in between, okay? Okay, so that's uh, the statement, but what I just said. And so here are some questions uh, related to uh, this topic. So what's the universal, like I said, universal maximum uh, epidemic region for this given uh, infinite delta regular graphs? Is it really like thick line epidemic region? Or is there any other uh, interesting graph having larger region? And then uh, the other two are like making some variation, like what if an infinite graph is not regular? Okay. And what about like graph is finite? So the graph is finite, our same definition cannot apply anymore because in the infinite case, the portion of this initial uh, set is just nothing, right? Because it's finite. But if your graph is finite, then portion should be should be at most like little o of n, maybe, right? So maybe we can just simplify the situation. Like, what about like just only one uh, innovation, like one uh, instigator, just one person starts to adapt new things, and then can this be spread? or not, right? So um, let me quickly mention, I'm not going to get into more details about uh, some variation that uh, of what we do toward this finite uh, network. But I think it's interesting to mention some of these other uh, examples of various examples of this network, especially with this, what is called like social networks. So uh, we kind of, I think, mimicked the idea of this uh, payoff uh, matrix with this finite irregular uh, case. But uh, the R, instead of just the same R, so the total cost with this degree delta will be R times delta. So now we consider this total cost is fixed to every vertex. And now it is divided by how many neighbors to share with. So C over any vertex of D will be a reasonable, like uh, this comparing, comparing value. So if the graph is regular, then this is just the same as R, right? But in this case, we just fix C first, and then this payoff will be given by this degree C over D, B. So obviously, if a graph is finite and they, but still many vertices and complicated, and degrees are very different, uh, then it's really difficult to calculate uh, with this uh, precise value. But rather, uh, Michael Offer is an expert of this simulating. He's a physicist on doing this. Uh, 
computational and uh, statistical part of the physics. So he simulated many uh, large uh, finite networks. But to do that, we have to make a precise definition first. So we made this definition like to a contagion game in a finite graph with this heterogeneous degrees. The contagion threshold can be still defined, but not just one the way we did with this infinite graph case or regular case, but rather than just expectation value of this maximum Q. So we just take different kind of uh, sequence and then take the value with that sequence and then take all this expectation. So in theory, well, it may be almost impossible to obtain the exact value, but in a simulation, like this algorithmic way, like that's what he does, like apply this uh, many iterations and then take this uh, expectation or average value. And um, to spread the whole graph from the state in which all the vertices adapt the option B, except for one vertex, we call it an instigator, that adapts and keeps the option A through the contagion game that all vertices except the instigator perform best response, update as many times as possible. And then for the bilingual option, we uh, put this cost part as in the uh, previous uh, payoff matrix, and then uh, define this contagion threshold the same way, but this threshold will be depending on the value C again. So uh, we have these kind of model or definition. And then we play a contagion game with bilingual option and also without bilingual option, two parts, uh, on three different families of finite graphs. And then we take this uh, regular lattices. And this lattice is different from what we say in like partial order set, but in more like physics uh, area. So I prepared some of these examples with pictures and the regular random network, and then scale C network. So, uh, and then we, focus on their uh, different structural difference uh, among those three different networks. How are they different? So the first one is the clustering coefficient. Clustering coefficient is just the ratio of the number of triangles over any triples. So how probable, like whenever you have like three vertices in your graph, and then if two vertices are uh, adjacent, and then the other third one is still uh, making this triangle or not. So that's called the clustering coefficient. And then diameter, uh, we know that. And then deg degree distribution. So with these three properties, aspects, uh, this regular random uh, network has very low clustering coefficient. But in the literature, like everyone says, that, well, this is low clustering coefficient, but we couldn't find any reason anywhere. But we uh, asymptotically calculated it. And then it is like delta is just a regular degree, uh, the valency minus one over the size, I mean, uh, the number of vertices. And then when n grows, it becomes zero, something like that. In that sense, it's low. But uh, the small world network, it's known to have like high clustering coefficient. But the small world from the name, uh, the diameter is really small. And then the degree distribution. Uh, can describe what the scale-free network usually is. And then uh, scale-free network has like parallel degree distribution. So this K is all the degree, degree K is one, K is two, K is three. And then uh, the high degree is dropping by like one over K to the R. But it's not, uh, it's not as small as the small old case because that's an, um, exponential uh, you know, shape. But anyway, uh, with these different structural um, properties, uh, my colleague just simulated over this uh, contagion threshold. But before that, let me quickly show you some of this nice picture, like regular lattices, they, when they call in like physics. And these are called like arc median lattice. And then they have all these technical uh, numbers. And then usually, the degree is the same, but their shapes 
have only like one type. Like the first two have only like triangle and rectangle, but the other have like two different types. And depending on uh, the shape, they have these uh, numbers. But just showing you. And then we just focus on some of this regular lattice kind, and then uh, regular random and scale free. And the simulation shows that you don't need to focus on every detail, but it just shows that, well, that dotted line is about uh, the usual uh, bound. But uh, for example, this average degree, and then we consider this contingent threshold and comparing this uh, scale free with slightly, diff I mean, the same, for example, like same clustering coefficients, but what about the size? So on. And then the other one is among those scale-free network, we just uh, consider what about like increasing clustering coefficient and what's the effect of this uh, uh, contagion threshold. Right. So um, let me quickly mention this a very casual way. So without so that. Result is about uh, the simulation when we don't have this bilingual option. We have only option of A and B. And then uh, without this uh, bilingual option for delta regular, whether it's regular random or uh, random regular or just any regular, then uh, the threshold is always one over the degree. So that's an independent of network structure. So it's not the surprising but on the other hand this uh, scale free network thing I mean the value is higher than regular random or like one over delta in this case although this where this delta is just average degree but still this is bigger than one over its average degree so we were curious why this happens because maybe if it depends only on the degree they should be less than one over I mean with the same uh, average degree, they should be the same as the reg, uh, ran, uh, regular case, but that didn't happen. So maybe this heterogeneity will play some role, but in what way? So we try to find our plausible explanation. It's not like proof, but plausible explanation is maybe uh, put to this uh, scale-free network, there would be two things that will affect uh, the epidemic um, process. One is what is called the friendship paradox uh, effect by felt. So you may have heard of some uh, complaints or comments like your friends always have more friends than you are. No? <laughs> no, you never thought about you're the one who have the most friends all the time? Not really, right? <laughs> and then that's not wrong because if you calculate the average degree of your neighbors, and then um, that is the average degree of the whole graph, then always this average degree of the neighbor is bigger than the average degree. Unless uh, the sigma is the standard deviation of degree distribution. So if your graph is regular, then they are the same, always the same, right? But in our world, well, the links are not regular, right? And some people have more friends and some people have less friends. In that case, your feeling is correct, unless you're the one who has the most friends, right? And so uh, this, uh, so from that observation, uh, by the way, this uh, result is uh, from like 1991. It's pretty recent, right? But anyway, uh, it's harder to persuade its neighbors in a highly heterogeneous network whose standard deviation is pretty large, right? But why the, uh, the scale-free network has like bigger number than this regular network? It doesn't explain fully in that sense. And now we think that maybe uh, this would be the reason. So on the other hand, it's harder for the instigator to persuade its neighbors by the friendship uh, paradox effect, but some neighbors of Inscator may have degree smaller than its average. So maybe it's easy to persuade first. Then the 
contagion process can continue through these channels first. And their neighbors with large degree are hard to persuade, but it's possible to persuade them later. So maybe like making a detour. It takes like longer than uh, spread with, without this uh, heterogeneous degree, but with the help of other paths from the instigator to the nodes. So maybe that uh, together with these will cause uh, the situation, but we're not sure whether this is uh, this complete answer or not. And then that's the result about this width bilingual option with the contagion uh, threshold. So although uh, this is a simulated result, you see this clear kind of shape, like the boundary. So maybe that boundary will change uh, the, qual uh, the qualitative change of this contagion uh, threshold or epidemic region. And then we try to find real reason, or is it really like that? Is it only from the simulation? But what about the actual, like if you, can you find this uh, actual like analytic solution about the result? But uh, I think it's still uh, worth to mention about this topic. And by the way, I already spent uh, more than like 50 minutes. Can I go a little bit more? <laughs> because I haven't started the second topic yet. So but let me quickly <laughs> introduce the bunch of problems, right? And then uh, see whether you're interested in or not. So the second part of, uh, second aspect of today's uh, this game theory uh, aspect is now the situation is a bit different. There are agents who want to form, so we have some uh, vertices, like in, independent sets. And then um, vertices want to form links with other vertices. Among those vertices, links are created by two vertices this region. In fact, in this case, just one vertex system. I want to connect with you, then it is connected. But in that case, I must pay for buying this edge. And then the other party will have this edge for free. And this situation is called unilateral. I mean, you can just decide whatever you want. But there is a version of this bilateral case. In that case, to create this uh, edge, to form an edge, each, uh, both party must agree to pay because they will pay for this shared uh, cost. But in this case, that's the unilateral situation. And now network creation game is to form a connected graph on n vertices by forming edges that are links created by two edges. But certainly, there should be some rule. And then each player wants to play uh, to maximize their payoff like the previous game. And then uh, now just the rules of the game is each player will choose its neighbor set. And then eventually they will take the union. And then uh, a graph is determined. But what kind of rule is there in this game? So in this network creation game model, the cost function consists of two parts. Price of edges to buy. And then distance cost from a vertex to all the rest of the vertices. So uh, for each vertex, uh, the cost is determined by once a vertex determines some of its neighbors to uh, buy or to pay, then the size of the neighbors okay, times alpha. Alpha is the cost per edge, plus all the sum of these distances from uh, the vertex to well, the rest of them. And that's the price. I mean, that's the cost for each vertex. But we also consider the total cost of this whole game. And then now we just add up uh, all the sum from i1 to n. Then that's exactly the same as alpha times the number of edges plus the sum of all these distances for two uh, vertices, like any, every pair of these vertices. And the question is, how costly is this without central coordination or without any country, uh, any coordination? So like how chaotic without this central authority? And in other words, we want to measure the max, maximum ratio of this social cost over the minimum social cost on n vertices. 
Now you can find an answer for like to minimize this total cost. What kind of format, like what kind of uh, structure will make this uh, minimize? But things are not working this way. There's no like central uh, controller to say, well, you have to put, uh, you have to connect with this vertex and that first. No, everybody is very selfish. <laughs> they just want to maximize their own benefit. That's the situation. Uh, this, right, so this S is like uh, the vector of each component is this neighbor set of each vertex. So, so, yes, right. So there are various, various cases, but the minimum is just one case. Like among all the possible such creations, what will reach this minimum cost? So there's one, like one common, like constant value, and then this will determine uh, the size of value. So, but instead of considering all the possible, like this uh, vector, this S, it's more, uh, maybe it's worth to consider some of what is called this master equilibrium. There, there, I think there are various reasons. One is like uh, to narrow down your candidates to compare with. And then when this master equilibrium is one, it's an equilibrium. So once you reach this equilibrium, things won't change. So the game can change a lot of ways because you have to interact with your neighbors and then depending on, I mean, if uh, the game goes on, then the payoff will, I mean, the cost function changes in the value, right? But once you reach this Nash equilibrium, nobody can move. So that can be uh, a reasonable way if people uh, play this game like, selfishly. But there's still some questions that we have to resolve, I'll tell you later. So the concept of this natural equilibrium has good relevance to the selfish behavior of each individual. So now we just narrow down uh, this candidate to only the natural equilibrium, the value. No, one at a time. So you, in your turn, and then everybody else does not change. Then now it's your decision to change other option or just stay with it. And then if everybody uh, has this decision that, well, I have to stay with it because this, in this current situation, once, uh, unless, every, unless other people change the, uh, the strategy, then I'll get the most benefit, then I'll just stay with it. So if that happens in some structure, then that's the equilibrium. So here is the definition. So let G of S, the vector, with the set of uh, the neighbor set of each vertex, the graph determined by this strategy, this particular strategy. And then if this graph is a master equilibrium, meaning that Some structure. So every player. Now you will you will decide whether you will stay with the current structure, or you will buy more edge, or you just uh, delete more edge. So you have those options. But if others are still staying, then when you calculate it, it gives the maximum or like a uh, minimum cost to you. Then you decide to stay with it. Now, if that happens with every vertex, then this structure is called a Nash group. And actually this uh, structures, uh, these structures exist. So for example, now when alpha is small enough, it's easy to find what kind of Nash equilibrium examples will be there. So when alpha is between zero and one, Every Nash equilibrium must have diameter one. Why? Because the distance is counted by one at a time, but the value is less than one. So it's better to buy more edges, right? To reduce the cost. 
So it's pretty uh, simple, like trivial case, but still it's uh, similar. A situation can apply when alpha is less than two. So in that case, every nested root program has diameter at most two. So the first case, we have only one option, like one graph, complete graph is the case to have diameter one. And the second case, any graph, connected graph with diameter two, what kind of graph are there? <laughs> complete graph has diameter one, but there are too many edges, right? Uh, the cost is at least one. It's better to save uh, uh, the cost. So star graph is equilibrium. And then star will be equilibrium even when alpha is bigger than two. But uh, when alpha is less than two, star is the maybe the only uh, example of this equilibrium. But alpha is greater than two, there are more uh, examples. And then uh, the, when alpha is maybe bigger than one, and at most four, the Peterson graph is known to be a nested equilibrium. And then star is still a nested equilibrium. And note that if alpha is very large, like n is the number 36, and if alpha is really, really extensive, like greater than n squared, then no reason. Once it's connected by just minimum number of edges, like uh, three, then no, right? no one has any desire to pay extra. So in that case, it must be three. Then what about like alpha is still not too small, but not too big. Like alpha is between maybe some constant and less than n squared. So those are interesting but uh, difficult part. And then uh, people who suggested this, uh, formulated this model for the first time, uh, actually uh, conjectured that there exists a constancy, not depending on n, such that every nested equilibrium is a tree, must be a tree. So maybe you can exclude alpha is at most four because alpha is less than four then Peterson graph is one example but what about like alpha is bigger than 10 or 100 so there should uh, must exist some fixed constant but and after that like lots of people uh, try to resolve this tree conjecture and then uh, but I'll uh, mention some of this results after this Page. And what about this? Uh, so, did I mention the name of this uh, ratio? The minimum, uh, sorry, maximum. Sorry, that's the maximum. And then that is called the price of anarchy, right? So, price of like chaos. So, there's this POA or price of anarchy. So, to calculate it, um, what about this uh, social optimum example? Which, which graphs uh, saves the most price? So when alpha is between 0 and 1, the minimum cost is, is achieved when the graph is complete. And then Nash equilibrium was complete graph, so it's just one. The best perfect case. It's not chaotic at all. Everyone can play anyway, right? But when alpha is between 1 and 2, and then uh, the smallest cost uh, is achieved when the graph is still complete. So now you calculate the cost of complete graph and then cost of star graph. And this gives like at most four thirds. So it's so it's pretty good, right? It's just constant bound. It's still pretty good. And then what about alpha is at least two? Then the minimum cost is, is achieved when the graph must be a star. So uh, the denominator is determined, and then now uh, the problem is about the numerator. And there are more uh, results about this. Uh, the value of price of the anarchy, the diameter is closely related to this any natural equilibrium with this alpha value. And then the diameter of any natural equilibrium with alpha is at most twice of square root of alpha plus one. And then with some a bit more arguments, they showed that this uh, value is at most 17 square root of alpha. So still the value depending depends on alpha and then what about like when alpha is increasing. But the Good news. So there are more known results with the same people. And one is for every epsilon positive, there exists a natural equilibrium with this uh, price of anarchy larger than 3 minus epsilon. So 
in some sense, uh, you can find like as bad as like three times of this uh, chaos of this uh, optimum case. And then the other results are uh, for every three mesh equilibrium, the total cost is at most five times of this minimum cost. So if tree conjecture was true, then the price of the anarchy is just only uh, at most five, and in some uh, after some constant. But uh, there's some bad news. One is uh, in up to here, still good news. Alpha is at least twelve n log n. Uh, then every Nash equilibrium is a tree. It's not a constant, right? Because the tree conjecture is saying that well, there should exist certain constant, but in this case, it depends on uh, n. But still, like compared to like n square and n log n, uh, it uh, is meaningful. But uh, the bad news is that. In some sense, it, dis it disproves the conjecture because for any positive integer n0, there exists a non-tree, uh, Nash equilibrium, with n many vertices, which is at least this fixed number n0, vertices for any value alpha between 1 and square root of n over 2. So that means, well, the constant does not exist anymore. But still, that doesn't mean that, well, then uh, the conjecture is completely gone. I mean, there are still uh, lots of interesting parts that does not uh, violate this result and the conjecture at the same time. So the others are, like for example, like alpha is bigger than 4 and minus 13. Every Nash equilibrium must be a tree, so it's a great improvement compared to this uh, result. And then the price of anarchy is constant, which is at most three plus number. So the worst case is just three point something. So still, it's uh, a good uh, result. And then you can recognize <laughs> the group of people. They are the graph theorists that we all know. Uh, for non-integer alpha bigger than two, when n is bigger than alpha cubed, the price of anarchy is asymptotically 1 plus little o of 1. So for this lar large portion, then this is almost the same as just the uh, optimal case, right? And then for this integer value, at least 2, then price of anarchy has this lower bound. So it cannot be just 1, but slightly bigger than 1. So. Okay, so now I mean, they uh, different results uses uh, different uh, method, and some people use like Perl's method, and some people use some of this constructive way. But uh, I have some like one, I mean, a bunch of questions. But that's uh, the most interesting part for me because, like I said previously. Among all of these, uh, Nash equilibrium is an equilibrium in the sense that once it reaches equilibrium, that's just the limit of the convergence. But still, uh, I'm not sure whether every uh, way, like no matter how you play, it will eventually converge to somewhere. It's not sure. And it doesn't have to be. But uh, people who are working on these problems are only focusing on just uh, existence of equilibrium, equilibrium. But uh, maybe like when, like how easy to reach this equilibrium? If there is an easy way or some like uh, method of creating this natural equilibrium, it might be reasonable to consider only this equilibrium parts. But if what about what if it's too hard and then it's not uh, making, I mean, not uh, appearing. Uh, very uh, often, then is it still meaningful? So we try to um, find some algorithm to create, like uh, when people are playing selfishly all the time, then would this dynamic or would this rule can be adapted to make some algorithm to find this Nash equilibrium? And there's one day like greedy algorithm, the um, trivial case, but they only create uh, stars. But there are other examples, like for those three Nash equilibriums, there are other examples, and then how do we create 
these kind of uh, uh, graphs, like in what kind of me mechanism. And then we have another problem, uh, like what if you have this degree, maximum degree restriction? Then if you apply this greedy algorithm, then the way you create the graph, it's not a Nash equilibrium anymore. So we have those uh, difficulties, but still, uh, we think that we can find uh, some of this method to create this uh, Nash equilibrium. So that's the second part. But still, the first one is meaningful in uh, related to the previous page on the tree conjecture, fill in the gap for alpha between n and 4n minus 13. So it, it, either way, like the conjecture, uh, a, a little bit uh, modified way the conjecture or completely disprove uh, some other way. And then uh, maybe restricted to just tree structure, can you find all the possible tree Nash equilibrium? This is not an easy question either. But uh, those are the list of problems that I want to pose. And then that's the end of the slide. And then those are references of the first topic. And then those are, I only like included just parts, not everything, but those are the references uh, of the second topic. And then, thanks for listening to my talk. In that case, you cannot avoid some cycle, right? Uh, yeah. But uh, they didn't find any like uh, non-tree national equilibrium as example. So I don't know. That might be really difficult. Apart from the complete graph, I guess. Mm. Do, do you have any non-star trees that you know are national equilibriums? Yes, there they have some examples, some well, constructions. What do they look like? They have like rotate tree with some controlling their uh, number of uh, descendants, something like that. But uh, those, I have seen only two okay. different types of examples. <laughs> but they, most of them focus on like whether like how like how to prevent this cycle or how the existence of the cycle will uh, prevent this. But the actual construction uh, sounds really difficult to work on. Yeah. And then in general, in other contexts, not this particular game, like in general, like creating this uh, Nash equilibrium is a big uh, area of uh, the research, big uh, research area. I guess. Yeah. Right. So maybe, I mean, if, if we have a question, we can continue in the dinner. So, okay. So let's take the second one.